Hey there, my name is Seth Juarez. We're here at the Microsoft Research Faculty Summit 2015. I'm here with David Rothschild. Hey, thank you for having me on the show. Tell us a little bit about what you do. My research is about understanding how and why people provide information in different settings, and then thinking, once you have that data, how do you aggregate that into something useful? And if you get there something useful, can you figure out how people utilize that and market intelligence to, to make decisions and allocate resources. And so it's thinking about that path from data collection to data analytics to data consumption. Now this is an interesting field because Nate Silver brought this to four in the previous election and it's all the craze to start predicting. But you're telling me that it's a little bit different than what he did, some of the stuff you're doing. And Nate Silver does a, a great job in, in taking a lot of the data that's available and trying to figure out a way to make it digestible and make it consumable. And I think that we really handle a lot more on that first step as well, which is to think, how is that data coming into play and how can we make that even better? So if you think about polling, uh, people go out there and traditionally, and a lot of the data that Nate Silver and all these other uh, poll aggregators utilize, it's based on this idea that you want to find a random and representative group of people. This is extremely costly, it's an extremely slow process, and we're sitting there with all these people opting into internet polls. And one of the challenges we want to say is, can we actually make that data useful? Can we figure out ways in which we can get the right question to them and design the question in a way that really extracts the information we want? Can we work on actually incentivizing them in this opt-in environment to provide meaningful data? And then once that data is collected, then can we turn to what are the estimation techniques now going to be for this new type of data? And we're going to be on that forefront and hopefully the stuff that we're building here will be turned over to the Nate Silvers of the world in a couple of years as that standard data that they're now using. How are these polls going to be presented to like your average user? So what we see is that people like opting in uh, and people like providing information. Um, but right now, because the research community has not taken this type of polling seriously, uh, there hasn't been any sort of effort to think about, well, really, what questions maybe could be most valuable for this different type of community? And so, for example, traditionally, we've always asked people about their intentions. Would you buy these pair of jeans? Uh, would you vote for this candidate? Well, we're working and turning on the head and thinking, well, who do you expect this, uh, to win this election? Do you think your social network will be buying these types of genes? We see that actually by just even changing the question, uh, that's been very effective. And rather than returning just raw counts or simple averages, it's going to be running some very, very meaningful modeling and post stratification over that data to turn this really unrepresentative opt-in sample into something that's actually meaningful. That's actually a really strong statement that you're able to surmise a distribution by simply asking a few questions, one question. Yeah. How do you do that? What we see is that the way we've been testing uh, these concept of understanding and how well we elicit is actually a fairly new idea in academia because it's been tough for people to explore this way. We provide people some background information, give them some time to forget it or, or not think about it, uh, and then we ask them in certain different ways to regurgitate that back or make expectations off that. And we see which methods are most efficient and these kind of complex sounding but actually pretty, pretty neat looking uh, distribution builders kind of following on this method of dropping balls into buckets have worked really nicely for us. That, that's fantastic. Now, inherently, when we're taking any kind of sampling, there's bias. And you talked a little bit about some of the background processes you're doing. How do you eliminate bias, and what are some of the background processes you're doing once you get this information? So, any single poll, whatever you do, anytime you engage with people, it's not going to be fully representative of the population. Uh, and even if it was, uh, there's going to be bias in how people are responding uh, by different modes or just because of the conditions of the day. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is the same type of thing that affects telephone polls, it affects door-to-door uh, -door polling, um, and we need to understand uh, number one, you know, we have a smaller sample than the full world. What does that mean? Number two, we don't have the coverage to cover everyone. Number three, people respond or don't respond and they make a choice there. And then number four, there's all sorts of error that can be and bias that can be incumbent with simply just the way we ask a question. And what we do is we look at how people respond and rather than simply accepting that this is representative of all people who look like them or all people in a certain segment, uh, we model and we basically run a series of regressions 
over the demographics and all the ways that we can describe them, all the ways we think that they could be different than the general population. And through that, we help learn how different traits influence or correlate with different types of answers for different questions. And that helps us understand better exactly how the population we see uh, may be different from the general population. And the, the standard method really kind of puts the head in the sand and just assumes, hey, this methodology works. Ours just confronts bias head on looks at it and says, we're going to try to find those variables that define it, and we're going to ask about those variables, and then we're going to essentially post-stratify those away by modeling and post-stratifying over our general population. So let's talk about Prediction Lab. This is something that you're working on. What is it and what is it for? So the Prediction Lab is a way in which we can bring together a lot of the research that, that my, me and my team have been doing on a lot of separate different things whether or not it's this polling type work, and also prediction games, which are built off of uh, prediction market intelligence. And so the idea is that we finally want to build long-lasting, durable infrastructure uh, that could stand alone, but more likely and more hopefully, power a lot of different types of solutions. So you sit there and you think about something like opt-in polling uh, that may be a, a widget on your favorite website. Mm -hmm. It may be uh, somewhere where you just uh, kind of go separately and answer questions. Or it could be think about all the different silly games that people play online. Uh, we want to build uh, a way in which uh, they, these answers, these questions uh, can then be turned around into something useful. And so when it comes to this idea of supplying the right question to the right people, to thinking about how that should be designed, thinking about different incentive structures that can answer these questions, uh, we want to build a, both a front end and back end technology that could hook into anything um, and actually supply that for people so that rather than seeing raw counts, uh, when you uh, answer your silly internet poll over who do you hate more, Britney Spears or Lindsay <laughs> Lohan or whatever the, uh, the newest uh, question would be, sure. um, you can actually, rather than just get the raw counts, you're actually going to get something that is uh, modeled and post-stratified on the general uh, population or maybe okay. even down to people of your demographic or another demographic that you care about. Uh, it's building uh, that all in one place so that we can service uh, not just the Microsoft community, but also hopefully something that could be an enterprise solution down the line. So Prediction Lab feels like it's a front end way of delivering polls and a back end way of making sense of it. Is that right? That's exactly right. And so we definitely stand alone and we definitely have all the front end technology. I think that some of the things that would be more exciting to a lot of uh, uh, researchers is going to be what's on the back end. So it's both uh, talking about this idea of modeling and post stratifying, but in the prediction game lab uh, part of it, part of the lab, what we're really doing is focusing a lot on what I'll call a combinatorial market maker. The idea here is that uh, we create a game system where people can come in and make predictions, and when they make predictions, uh, they influence the predictions of everything else that we have in that game. That's right. um, and so what makes this unique is that most predictions are done independently. And when you do uh, predictions independently, uh, you have a lot less dispersion of the information yeah. because there's only so many questions that somebody can answer. If you connect everything, then when someone answers a question here, it affects all of the questions around. That's great. The second part of it is that it helps give us answers to questions that we previously didn't know. Um, I see. The relationship between different outcomes. And so I like to point to the Great Recession of the late 2008, 2009. We knew independently that bonds were risky. There wasn't a full understanding that there was nearly 100% correlation between a lot of these bonds. And once one went down, everything was going to go down together. Um, understanding correlations is actually something which is just simply too hard to do in the past. Yeah. Because the computation necessary to do it is actually approaches impossible. And so a lot of what we're doing is actually approximating it. We're looking at the dimensions that are most important first and then building outwards and actually having an active learning algorithm that figures out what it needs to be checking on next. And it's really exciting to see because we really think this will actually uh, really change the way that people think about predictions. And rather than thinking about them as independent outcomes, but think about them as this whole ecosphere of possible things that can happen and how they relate to each other. This is an interesting topic because I was recently reading something on the New York Times or some other journal where they said, if you want to continue reading, answer this poll. And, and that's like a really interesting way of, they're not ads, but they're polls. But now on the back end, what, are some of, what is some of the work we can do to sort of take this crowdsourced data to make it more powerful? 
So the way to make it more powerful is to be thinking that every time anyone has an interaction, what is the best interaction in terms of the researcher? Mm -hmm. And one is trying to optimize engagement, and number two is trying to optimize the data that they're providing in that question. And so uh, this is a constant, sometimes complementary thing and sometimes trade-off that you're thinking about to say that you have so many times that you can engage with people. Um, how do you figure that out? And it, it all circles back to the idea that you want to be agnostic. Uh, you want to look at individuals and say, some people may answer simple poll questions. Some people may answer complex poll questions. Some people may be thrown into some sort of detailed game situation. You want to be able to figure out based off of the things they've done in the past and the demographics they have that are shared with other people you've seen, what you can do to maximize those engagements, both for their engagement and for the information you get from them. And that's really where the technology is moving. Then that's really where that you're going to see a cosmic shift, a, a huge disruption in a $21 billion industry that is really built on technology that's 75 years old now. It's built on the same technology that Gallup and Roper and a few others uh, pioneered in 1936 before the computer that can provide the, the advanced statistics behind the, the data collection and before the internet, which allowed us to reach people uh, quickly and efficiently. So just to, in closing, what's the future for forecasting given all this stuff you're doing? The future for forecasting is going to be uh, wide and it's going to be deep. And so whereas forecasting right now is much more uh, narrow on a few types of questions you can answer uh, and, and it's very much a high aggregation, what we're looking at down the line is, is the ability to answer whatever question you're interested in and at a depth of demographics or other breakdown that is un unimaginable at this point. It's moving from a world in which maybe people were predicting uh, who would win the presidential election to a world in which you can think of any combination of any states, uh, or which is two to the power of 51 possible outcomes, or moving to the idea of how any demographic is going to vote in any sort of combination of states, which is you know much larger than that, to thinking even about the conditional outcomes of elections on a host of economic and political indicators. So you move from a, a very, very tiny world, uh, a very high level tiny world to a very wide and deep world. Well, this is really good. Thanks for spending some time with us. Thanks for watching and we'll catch you next time.